we begin a, a discussion of agency. Let's suppose that Juan was employed as a UPS driver. UPS trained Juan how to drive their trucks. They kept the truck in good repair. They were careful when they hired Juan. But despite all of that, Juan drove negligently and ran over Shen as she was crossing in the crosswalk with the light in her favor. Does Shen have a good lawsuit? Well, in Shen versus Juan, certainly. She has the lawsuit against Juan for the cause of action of negligence. In this hypothetical, Juan failed to exercise reasonable care. So she has a good lawsuit against him. But isn't there a better defendant out there? UPS has more money than Juan does, and they're likely to have insured the truck that Juan was driving. And so Shen is much more interested in suing UPS than in suing Juan. What cause of action, if she has any, what cause of action, if any, does she have against UPS? Was UPS negligent? Well, in our hypothetical, no, they weren't. They used care in hiring Juan. They used care in training Juan to drive the truck. They used reasonable care in keeping the truck in good repair. So, no, UPS in this hypothetical was not negligent. Are they liable for Juan's negligence? And the answer is probably yes. And this is what we'll be studying with the law of agency. When can someone be held liable for someone else's conduct? This is sometimes referred to as vicarious liability. When are you liable for what someone else has done? This is the law of agency. Why have such a rule as vicarious liability? Well, partly because it's necessary and in any business economy, you have to allow s some people to act on behalf of others. It is impossible to even imagine big businesses without agents representing these large organizations. And this provides for vicarious liability, so that the party who is getting the benefit of all those agents' actions also pays the cost of their activity. And look at it. Should Shen have planned to get hit by Juan that day? Well, you know, in a sense, we should all be careful and have insurance and et cetera. However, if you work for UPS, and let's say you work in risk management, do you know that there will be an accident involving one of your drivers this year? Of course you do. This is a large organization. They have many, many thousand employees, all of whom are on the roads. Of course there's going to be an accident. How do you plan for that? Well, you engage in risk management. You buy insurance, you make sure people are trained to use the equipment, you make sure that you're careful about who you hire. All of those activities create a societal good because it means that UPS is going to do everything possible to reduce the risk of liability because it's going to be their liability. Now, I want to caution you, just because we're moving on to this area of vicarious liability, it doesn't mean you should forget what we've learned so far. Let's assume that UPS is liable for Juan's negligence. Is Juan liable? Yes, in our hypothetical, he was negligent. That means Shen now has two defendants, Juan with a cause of action of negligence, and UPS under an agency theory that we will be talking about soon. And again, the policy reasons, the reasons why it is considered fair to hold UPS liable, although they did nothing wrong in this hypothetical. It's trying to encourage those who can to plan for the risk and to take the safest measures possible. Now, how do you create an agency? An agency is created by three things. An agreement, that the agent will act for the benefit of the principal at the principal's direction or control. Must the agreement be written? The general answer is no. It's simply an agreement, the whole benefit thing. Well, let's go back to Juan and the UPS example. Did Juan agree to work for the benefit of UPS? Yes. But wait, wasn't Juan also benefiting? Well, sure, because he was getting paid by UPS. However, when he was working, who was he supposed to be working for? For himself or for UPS? He agreed to work for UPS, so any benefit from his activities, for example, if he collects payments for deliveries, it's understood that it is for UPS's benefit, not for his. 
any property he's using of UPS's, it's understood he can't take that for himself because he's supposed to be acting, he agreed to act, for the benefit of UPS. And the third element, did Juan agree to act at UPS's direction or control? This becomes more important in the next chapter, but let me just give you a heads up. Direction means being told what to do. Control means being told not just what to do, but also how to do it. And if you think about some of your own jobs, what was it you were agreeing to? To be told what to do or also how to do it? If you go to your dentist and ask for a, an exam, you may be agreeing to, as far as what they will do, but you're certainly not going to effectively tell them how to do it. They're the experts, not you. Now, let's assume that you are an account manager for a company. Do they have the power to not just tell you what to do, but also how to do it? Do they have the power to tell you what time to start working, what office you're supposed to work out of, what software system you should use, how you, how you set up your password, how often you take a vacation, whether there's a dress code in the office? It's not just direction, then. It's also control. So look at the distinction between these two things. And the outcome difference is that an independent contractor is simply told what to do. An employee, also called a servant, is told not just what to do, but how to do it. And this is true even if your principal elects not to control your work very closely. For example, at the university, does the university have the power to tell me, a professor, what time to show up for work? Well, they certainly have the power to do it, but they virtually never do it as long as I meet my classes and other obligations because they've chosen not to exercise much control over me. However, they do have the power to do it, of course. So that's the difference between an independent contractor being told what to do and an employee or servant being told not just what to do, but how to do it. Now. Suppose that Matt asks Laura if she will pick up his son when she picks up her own daughter at preschool. And Laura says, sure, I'll be glad to do it. Is Laura Matt's agent? Well, do they have an agreement? Yes, Laura agreed to help out Matt. That Laura would act for Matt's benefit? Well, yes, it is for Matt's benefit if she's going to pick up Matt's son. Was it at Matt's direction or control? Well, certainly Matt directed her what to do, in other words, pick up his son. He is not controlling how she is going to do it, but he's certainly directing her. Is she his agent for purposes of picking up his son? Yes. Do you see what doesn't matter here? Money. The fact that Laura is simply doing a favor for Matt doesn't negate the fact that she is his agent for purposes of picking up his son that day. So I want you to learn this definition of the creation of agency and the formation of agency and just follow it every single time. Be careful also because sometimes you will just assume that there is an agency even when there isn't one. Go back to this definition. How about this hypothetical? Suppose that Eileen and Brian are married and with Eileen not around, Brian decides to sell their jointly owned home to Joanna. When Eileen finds out about it, she's furious and says, well, you can't just sell what you don't own, Brian. Half of that house is mine. Is Eileen bound by that agreement? Well, was there an agreement between the married couple, Brian and Eileen, that Brian would act for the benefit of Eileen for the purposes of selling the house under her direction or control? Given the facts we have so far, the answer is no, there isn't. So just because the parties may have some other relationship, including joint ownership of some asset, doesn't necessarily mean that one is the agent for another. Go back again and look at the definition to test it. Here are a few miscellaneous items. The first one affects the hypothetical we were just talking about, and that's the equal dignities rule. The Equal Dignities Rule says that whenever an underlying agreement must have written evidence, any grant of authority to an agent must likewise have written evidence. When must a contract have written evidence? 
Well, we studied that earlier. It's the statute of frauds. The statute of frauds says that for certain contracts, and the two contracts we studied were contracts related to the sale of property and contracts for the sale of goods of $500 or more. Whenever there's a contract covered by the statute of frauds, any grant of authority would also have to be in writing because you have to give that authority equal dignity to the underlying contract. So another reason why Eileen would win her lawsuit against her probably soon-to-be ex-husband, Brian, is because of the equal dignities rule. Brian had nothing in writing to show that Eileen had made him her agent for purposes of selling their house. Therefore, there cannot be a valid agreement arising from that. You've probably heard the second term, power of attorney, before. A power of attorney simply means you are giving someone the power to enter into certain transactions on your behalf. This power can be very broad or very narrow. A very broad one would be a general power of attorney. And you might have wondered how someone can be an attorney if they're not really an attorney. The reason why is because an attorney is actually a person who is simply a legal representative. I'm an attorney at law, meaning the courts have accepted me as an attorney, but you could have someone else's power of an attorney even if you're not a lawyer. And this is common with people traveling abroad or with medical difficulties. If your husband, for example, is going into the Marines and he'll be going abroad, he may want to give his wife the power of attorney so she can enter into contracts on his behalf. If you're becoming incapacitated because of illness, you may want to give your accountant power of attorney so she can engage in agreements to protect your finances while you're sick. So a power of attorney is simply a particular form of agency. Capacity is something we haven't yet discussed. It just means the mental ability to understand what you're doing. Sometimes it comes up about whether someone had the ability to act on your behalf, and that's what they're referring to. We talked just a minute ago about authority. When does someone have the power to enter into a contract on your behalf or to represent you? We're going to discuss this in greater detail in the next podcast. Your book lists all kinds of categories of stuff. I think it's easier to add than subtract, so let's just say Here's another one, gratuitous agent. Most of these terms don't especially matter for our purposes. Just be able to recognize that they're forms of agency. Is there an agreement that one person would act for the benefit of the other at the other's direction or control? That's what you have to understand. A non-delegable duty is a duty you cannot delegate to someone else. It must be performed by the person who has that duty. What it means is, even if you do delegate it, you're still going to be liable if something goes wrong. For example, if the mortgage lender told you that they would get a termite inspection for your benefit and later they contracted out with another termite inspector to do that and the termite inspector negligently failed to report that there were termites in the house that you were looking to buy, it may well have been a non-delegable duty by the mortgage lender so that you don't have to chase this termite inspector who you never had any contact with. You could simply go after the lender and say, this was your duty to make sure that it met all the requirements of the loan, and therefore you can't simply say, well, it wasn't our fault. Independent contractors compared to employees will be discussed more in a subsequent podcast. Again, independent contractors are typically told what to do, and employees are told not just what to do, but how to do it. And again, here are all the miscellaneous terms that are used, general and special agents, gratuitous agents, sub-agents, etc. Everything else your book is telling you is correct, but almost none of it really matters.